What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Son of a Tech once again, and today, for the first time in three years, I'm going to talk about Varus Coin once again. I'm out here at Consensus 2024 with Mike, one of the lead developers of Varus Coin, and they use community funds to set this all up. And hopefully, we'll get some more information on what's been going on with Varus Coin since I looked at it last, what some of the changes are, and where they're headed in the future. So, welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. Thanks um, for having me. Where can people get in touch with you? I'm on Discord, on the Varus Discord, so varus.io slash Discord. Okay. Pretty much every day, unless we're at an event like this, I'm, I'm there at some point. Okay, cool. And what's the Discord username? Uh, Mike Toot. Mike Toot. Got yeah, it. Mike Toot, T-O-U-T. Yeah, yeah. T-O-U-T. Got yeah. it. All right, so that's how you can get in contact with them. Do you have a Twitter or anything like that as well? I do. Yeah, Mike Tatongi. Okay. On Twitter. Cool, and I'll put all that in the description below. So when I was, I guess the first time I covered Bears Coin was in 2021. I just looked today to make sure what the time range was. I did two videos. I did my WTF is, which is where I cover like what the coin is, what the consensus mechanism is, right? And where it's at in development, that sort of stuff and what makes it or sets it apart from other cryptocurrencies. And then I did the how to mine, and that was on CPUs at the time. <clears throat> and I covered how to mine it with your CPUs and that sort of thing. So a lot has changed. The, the consensus mechanism, though, as I understand it, proof of power still remains in place. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, that's fi is it 50% mining rewards, 50% uh, staking rewards? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And so from that perspective, that remains the same, but we've added new types of hardware now, right? Well, yeah, so we didn't really do that. Yeah. The, the uh, consensus mechanism, so you, you know that um, everything was fair launch. So like everything from the beginning was 50% uh, proof of work, 50% proof of stake, and we don't ever expect that to change. You know. It, the goal was certain things we believe, you know, as a decentralized platform, you know, you start that way and you should keep it that way, basically, because that's what everybody understood it from the beginning. Yeah. So, you know, if we ever do try to change everything, it's kind of it's like Bitcoin, basically. If people decide to follow some change, then, yeah, um, we'll make a change or we could make a change, not to emissions, um, I don't see any change happening for you know the proof of work or proof of stake or any of these things. Um, but if we're going to make a change, then it's the way that blockchain should be. You know, people have to agree across yeah. the network, um, like a decentralized system should work. And and so, yes, there's new hardware on the network now. But some of it is because we have uh, developers in the community that started making miners on phones. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually change the algorithm. Yeah, and what, they, can you remind me what the algorithm is again? I forgot. It's Varus hash. Ver it's, it is so its own it, thing. Yeah, it's a quantum, it's a post-quantum uh, hash that was then modified to be resistant to FPGAs. And, you know, I understand that a lot of your audience is uh, GPU yeah, mining. Um, there's actually an interesting project now that's utilizing Varus hash, but combining it with GPUs, and it forces a check so that you have one CPU per one GPU oh, interesting. on each machine. Okay. It has a kind of a meme name. It's Warthog, but they are using Varus hash okay. in that. So. I didn't. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's interesting. All so, right. Uh, a lot of people people are using it outside of just Varus. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the thing about the thing about Varus hash is that so when we modified, it was early on and maybe even before uh, 2021, when we modified the algorithm because we uh, had some secret FPGA mining on the network. Right. And we found out about it, tried to make a deal with them to open it up so it'd be completely open for everybody and they didn't want to do it. So we basically um, went in and, you know, I've got a lot of assembly language background and that kind of thing. And so we made it uh, so that, yeah, you could you can mine with a, an FPGA if you get an algorithm that can, but it, they don't beat CPUs okay, and they don't beat CPUs and they don't beat now phones because... Somebody came out with a phone miner, mm -hmm. and phones are like hash per watt, 
hash, you know, for the cost, they're great devices. So uh, a lot of phones are. So we've got, I would guess that maybe most of, not, not like, uh, you know, 90%, but probably there's more than 50% of the hash on the network is people mining with phones. People mm -hmm. set up, you know, phone banks and this kind of thing. And so the algorithm didn't change as much as people just implemented miners for uh, Androids. Yeah. And then the other device that's, I love this device, is the RockPi. You know, they're really inexpensive. Um, they get great hash per watt and they're, you know, so it's overall, those are great miners. Okay. So I think a lot of people are mining with the RockPies, a lot of people are mining with phones and, and still Ryzen's and, you know, some of the better, even newer Intel's are yeah. still really good for CPU mining. What I was gonna say is, on Veris Hash, you, we do have GPU miners, yeah. They just can't compete. They can't, yeah. They, they, they just, uh, you know, if you've got GPUs, you might want to do mining on some other, maybe Warthog, I don't know. Yeah. Because they do GPU, network. but then you might want to do the uh, mine Varus on the CPU mining. Yeah. I mean, my, my strategy, especially going or over the past bull run, was really to focus on speculative mining, things that aren't listed, that type of thing. I'm and glad you did on Varus because it looks yeah, like you're going to be in good shape Varus on that. did good, um, and I think, you know, there was Casp, a lot of other ones. And I think from the perspective, because this is the shift, and I was going to ask you this here, and it's leading and leading somewhere. There's a, there's a trend in, in crypto where you essentially you start out, right, and every, the, the algorithm is... is on CPUs, right? typically that's where you start. You're mining with CPUs, and eventually it moves to something like FPGAs and GPUs, or it goes GPUs and FPGAs, then eventually ASICs. And a lot of the new layer one proof of work coins, whether it's like Caspa or Radiant or uh, Nexa, all of them are kind of aiming to eventually end up on ASICs. Uh, do you guys have a position, or do you personally have a position on ASIC resistance at, at all? Like, or is so that's that a great question. You just let go. That's a great question because, so right now, like I said, uh, FPGAs mm -hmm. they don't compete, and we did that on purpose. We designed it so that you know somebody could you know mine an FPGA, but you'd kind of waste your money. Yeah. Um, better to get phones, rock pies, or, you know, probably the best uh, CPU miners or Ryzen's. And so um, the ASIC's a little bit of a different question because obviously, you know, what we do is we kind of look at a CPU, whether it's in a phone, whether it's in a PC, we look at a CPU as, you know, a chip with kind of some of the instructions are basically little ASICs inside mm -hmm. the chip, right? And so we designed the algorithm to leverage those inside CPUs as modern CPUs as much as possible and also leverage things that CPUs do well that FPGAs don't. Mm -hmm. So for FPGAs, if you really, if it's a really a programmable gate array, you can't get to the level of performance of an ASIC. Mm -hmm. But once somebody comes along and designs the actual hardware to, um, to mine an algorithm, no matter how much you're leveraging those little ASIC components inside of a CPU, you know, it's really, Tough really, I would it. say hard to impossible just because physics, if you've got an actual ASIC hardware designed around the algorithm, it's just, you know, the CPU's got some real estate on the CPU that isn't doing what the ASIC, all its real estate's just designed for that, right? Right. So then the question is, um, we have an algorithm that is really easy to modify in a way that if somebody went, you know, somebody came along and said, we're going to invest everything it takes to actually make the chip mm -hmm. that's going to mine that algorithm in hardware, not an FPGA, an actual ASIC, um, we are able to just, you know, change the algorithm. And then, like, as I said, if the network agrees mm -hmm. that we, and it's not just the proof of work, it's both the proof of power. So 
if the proof of stake and the people who are mining, you know, on other devices decide, hey, we would rather keep it on CPUs, it'll stay on CPUs because we'll do an upgrade on the algorithm and the investment into the ASIC would not mm -hmm. be a good investment for whoever made it. You know what I mean? Right. And so I don't know the answer. The algorithm is designed to be able to be perpetually ASIC resistant. But when you really start getting hardware like that, then yeah. someone's going to have to make a decision. Is, is, so on the GPU side of things, the argument's been like in favor of like the memory hardening and stuff like that to prevent the, the move to ASICs or at least make it more difficult. But that's not something from a CPU mineable algorithm that's really possible, right? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, way to do it because here's the problem. So what, what I did when designing the algorithm for, um, to basically stop FPGAs from mm -hmm. you know taking over all the mining, I did a lot of research into the hardware that was available. What the timing is, you know, between an FPGA and its local BRAM or whatever, you know, the 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 URAM, whatever mm -hmm. kind of RAM you might be able to use, and the same kind of analysis on CPUs. And so a lot of people they say, oh, we'll do the memory hardening and this. I actually don't think that that is long-term a solution because what I found is that in order to really beat FPGAs in the long term, we had to keep the algorithm inside the L1 cache because okay. that's the only place and that's where the why. CPUs can always and consistently beat the FPGAs because of their, you know, they're pushing, they're always pushing the state of the art on gate sizes and all this stuff. And so basically that was um, a decision and that's not, I don't know that anyone else did it that way. That's interesting. And, and, and that's why. And so it's not memory hardened. Right. It's hardened in the way, it does use memory in a way where the FPGA has to still use that memory, for example. Yeah. But it leverages all the strengths of CPUs and that extends to the phones and that extends to all the general purpose CPUs. And so, um, Actually, GPUs just kind of got caught in the middle. You know, so GPUs are just not great for mining it because in order to make CPUs able to do a better job than FPGAs, GPUs are kind of in, you know, they're not FPGAs. Mm -hmm. And so you can do, you can get better performance from an FPGA. So if we make it so that it doesn't work well for FPGAs, then GPUs kind of ended up a bit of a casualty in the right. process. So, um, yeah, the only question, if somebody decides that they're going to make ASICs for Varus, um, I think the only real question is, uh, will the network want that? Yeah. And, and our, our vision from the beginning. I get the, the feeling from being in the Discord and see, like just paying attention, I think they, won't. they won't like it. I think they won't yeah. like it. And, and, you know, because our original vision was accessible to everyone. Right. So that means, like, Everyone doesn't have an ASIC. Well, I've been getting real disheartened here at Consensus going to like the, the Bitcoin mining panels and, and listening to what everybody's saying where, you know, a lot of these guys are projecting like essentially even being an individual trying to host your ASICs is going to be near impossible in the next six months to a year because everything needs to go to vertical integration, which means from the substation to the facility, you own all of that as an owner operator, and Why? that's how you're going to be able to compete with the power cost uh, uh, for everybody else on the network. And the amount of capital to get there means that, like, really, like the everyday man yeah. working in IT or a developer that wants a little side hustle to to mine, it's that's not possible yeah. anymore. And, and so the other thing is, you know, one of the things that's changed since the last time you took a look uh, now. We have another uh, public blockchains as a service. That's the mm -hmm. Varus protocol. So we have uh, VR, V A R R R, um, that launched their own uh, PBAS blockchain okay. on the network. And so now people are merge mining. Is that a spinoff of Pirate Coin or something? It's connected to. It's basically uh, a way that um, people who have R 
can move to uh, Varus protocol right. and network, which but is also connected to Ethereum. So yeah. they kind of get that access to all the other connected networks and you can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, there were people from the uh, pirate community who did that launch because launching blockchains on the network is permissionless. And, yeah. and you know, we so of course gonna, help people understand how to do it, of course. merge and, mining, because I think traditionally merge mining, right? I think when people think about it, it would be like Litecoin and Dogecoin. You have a script ASIC miner yeah, and it yeah, can yeah. connect to basically both networks at the, and, then, and then hash out and solve those and provide it back and then you get paid back both. This is different in the fact that if you're merge mining, you're not merge mining Pirate and Varus necessarily, you're merge mining the uh, the block the, or the pirate chain that's on Varus. VR, the they time. call it VR. VR, yeah. right. So it's, you're getting, on that parallel chain, you're getting that payout, right? Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, so the, so the way that it works is the uh, Varus protocol allows you to dynamically merge mine. Just basically, it's kind of automatic. Mm -hmm. If you're running um, multiple nodes or if you're using a pool that does merge mining, um, they'll just find each other and they'll just start merge mining. So if you're uh, right now, we have uh, two blockchains on that protocol and we expect other chains to be launching and you can merge mine up to 22 chains at a time with a single hash, but there's an unlimited number of possible chains on the network. So you could have, you know, a thousand chains on the network and that's more bandwidth than probably all of crypto combined right now. Mm -hmm. it, actually it is definitely, you know, more than, um, all of the blockchains, uh, combined. I, I should say, I shouldn't say definitely cause I, I believe that that's the case, but maybe there's something that I don't know about that is, you know, in progress or something. Yeah. But basically, if you have any number of chains, you could serve everybody in the world doing transactions all day long, every day, but any single person can choose 22 of those chains to mine with a single hash mm -hmm. from across all of them. And so that's one of the reasons why I think people are probably not going to like uh, ASICs if they come online. And so it probably wouldn't be a good investment for someone to make ASICs mm -hmm. for the algorithm because then they might just put that investment in and be uh, knocked off right. almost immediately. And so I think the reason is because every time someone launches a new chain, you know, the idea is it's decentralized. The idea is it stays decentralized. And if somebody launches a new chain, maybe they're launching it for a community that actually wants to use, you know, maybe a city launches it or maybe a uh, you know, like you could imagine so a Las Vegas chain or something like that, where they actually do payments and they do, you know, DeFi and they allow people to come in from all over the world and you can convert your stable coin to the one that they, that they want to do their payments on and everything on the network. And if they're going to launch something like that, they might want people in Las Vegas to know about it mm -hmm. and to be able to just mine everybody, whether they are doing phones or, or CPU. So I think that whole concept of an unlimited scale network with dynamic merge mining of any number of chains across it probably keeps us very, you know, tightly connected to that, CPUs. Yeah, that helps. So that whole system, and correct me if I'm wrong, with that merge mining, if, if that's all of those chains getting merge mined, that helps on the DeFi side of things with liquidity, right? It or actually, no? it, it's, part of the provable cross chain. Mm -hmm. So actually it doesn't necessarily change. It, it strengthens the security. So if a chain launches on the Varus network, mm -hmm. then there, the fee that it's a rent free chain. So once it's launched, it's completely independent and nobody's paying any gas or any fees to Varus or any of the community or, you know, it's basically if a city launches a chain, then the city that, that is their, rent free right. network. But, but when somebody launches a chain, there's a fee for that chain launch. And that causes the new chain to start no matter what their rewards are, no matter right. how that ramp goes up and down, they specify what it is, they specify all their costs and fees and everything. No matter what that is, that first chain initially is going to be emitting more Varus 
because Varus can be on any of, other currencies can be on all the chains. It'll be emitting more Varus than the standard Varus block reward. You know what I mean? And okay. so all of the hash power that we've got on the network worldwide is going to be interested in merge mining any new chain to help give it that big boost of security. Because yeah. where we left off, was, That's what I was not we sure. Were, yeah, so I don't want to repeat. Yeah, so where we left off was essentially you were talking about the new parallel chains uh, automatically getting the security uh, from the various uh, main chain. Right. And there are benefits there uh, for the miners as well, right? Right. So, and that's because without the miners having to do anything, if my understanding is correct, they will start they will be able to get those rewards from those parallel chains or do the miners have to opt into that i suppose was my question because that ah so so basically if you are solo mining mm -hmm. then you need to run uh, a node of any of the chains that you want to merge mine with got it okay if you're solo mining yeah if you're mining with a pool then you know right now we've got uh, two blockchains on the protocol of an unlimited potential number of chains mm -hmm. and you can merge mine up to 22 chains but you would typically choose or the pool that you're mining on would we'll choose, choose which chains that it's going to merge mine because the pool would have to set up that node infrastructure exactly that, right? exactly so that can but the nodes the find cost of that from uh, a compute perspective for the pool operator not too much not it's much. you know the nodes they run on like they can run on a rock pie yeah you know so it's uh I would expect a pool might have a little beefier hardware for, you know, for their um, nodes. But a node doesn't really add much to the compute requirements because all the hash power is just shared across all the merge mine chains. So it doesn't really increase the compute requirements is it, much. Is it pretty easy to stand up those additional nodes? Yeah, so that is, it's basically, if you start a node, and it's on the same machine, mm -hmm. that's when they'll automatically find each other and when they'll just automatically merge mine. Okay. But if you have nodes that are on separate machines, then you got to do some configuration and the config files and point so them at each other, each other. Yeah. so that they see each other and they know where they are and then they'll do the merge. Just like if you were doing redundant nodes for a pool, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. It's it, basically the idea is if the nodes can find each other easily or either explicitly or just on the same machine, mm -hmm. then they will automatically kind of kick into merge mining mode. And in fact, you can, like a pool, although there's no reason to do it right now because we don't have more than 22 chains on the network yet, mm -hmm. but when there is more than 22 chains, you know, a pool could actually run like, say, 50 nodes if they wanted to, and just dynamically every block, you know, swap in the most profitable of the different chains to merge mine. Mm -hmm. So it's really easily, you know, it's dynamic and it's easily kind of switched around. Okay. So I'm going to ask uh, the question that I've been asking everybody else. And that is if we had unlimited power and basically at free cost, what would happen to Bitcoin? Right. So, so this is uh, where we kind of touched on stuff before uh, recording and, and the idea is, you know, if we got uh, some new advance for drilling, we got geothermal energy that would just give us maybe not infinite, but more than anybody ever needs worldwide, mm -hmm. right? Or, um, and then, you know, so the challenge would still be there's going to be a bottleneck on hardware. So just for this kind of ex thought experiment, you know, um, as long as there's some limit whether it's how many ASICs people can manufacture or there's demand for, um, you know, the Bitcoin network and POW basically is designed so that, you know, Bitcoin being the biggest network, it, it pretty much can use whatever power we have available as long as there's hardware to consume that power. And if you get more power than people need, more power than um, is used by, you know, all the other things that we use power for, then you'd still end up with a bottleneck on the hardware. Right. And so I think you're always going to have, because the, 
actual amount of hash power that the network can use is basically unbounded, you know, then you're still going to end up with the potential to use up whatever we have available, um, unless we had infinite hardware, and I think we're not going to get there. Right. And so, um, so I think, you know, the question would be, how much power do people want to, or how much uh, hash power, I'm not saying just energy, do people want to put on the network when you still have limitations to how much you can write to the network. There's no limitation on reading information. Everybody in the world could read at the same time and you know they could all have different nodes and, and it scales that way. But you know, it's still in single digit number of transactions per second written to the chain. Now I know people are working on uh, you know, kind of this Bitcoin L2 model. I mm -hmm. talked to uh, one of the core devs someone who was a core dev and um, that they're that they're looking at ways to basically extend kind of this l2 you know or spider chain kind of model and um, and so with that approach I don't know if they're even looking at merge mining or, or anything to do that but if they were then you could see that there might be ways to get more right scale but I think I think that before, if we had unlimited power, we'd certainly have the ability to make, you know, lots and lots of hardware. And my suspicion is that before we get to the physics, kind of the physical boundaries of the amount of hash power that we could put on the network, we might end up not putting that much on just because of the fact that there's this right scale limitation. And so not everybody in the world can actually use the chain. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know for sure. So, you know, the, the amount of power that you put on it, it could go up to whatever is the available kind of combination of energy and hardware. It could. Um, that would certainly uh, demand a super high price for Bitcoin yeah. if that happened. Um, or so you think the price would go up or down? I think that the more power, if people are putting more power on the network, it costs money to put more power on the network. If people are dedicating more hardware and putting more power on the network, the only reason that they would keep doing that is kind of like, a, it's, it's not like one side or the other. It's not like because the price goes up, only then people put more power. It's more like it's a, it goes both ways. Right. The more power you put on, the more hash power you put on, the higher the price goes because it costs more to get Bitcoin. But isn't that because the price, we currently have a price to the power or connected to that power, which drives that price of Bitcoin up. So is it... But we'll still have a price to the hardware. Remove, right. So you remove the power cost, but you still have the capital expenditure cost, right? Is Which is what I think Luxor had said, which is interesting. But does that mean that... I mean, would initially, would you see like a, I guess, I would think initially you'd see the price come down and then as more, so as power as is more free, equipment got it, deployed to the network, that that would get rolled into pushing the price back up. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting um, because I don't actually know the... Because what gives, what gives Bitcoin It's the power value? costs. Is right it, Right now... It's, it's the fact that um, it is the, you know, the first, the kind of, well, it's the biggest, obviously, but not just, not just in, um, in price. I'd say it's the biggest in awareness. Yeah. You know, even though Ethereum, like lots and lots and lots of people know about Ethereum, um, m more people know about Bitcoin than any other cryptocurrency. And On that point, though, I mean, the, the biggest problem that Bitcoin faces is that it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have the transaction fees or the the actual use that Ethereum has. Where yeah, yeah. It's... Ethereum kind of, you know, there were a lot of doomsday people when w during the transition to proof of stake for Ethereum. Like, oh, well, you're not going to have any base power cost. Therefore, there's no cost to mint, which means there's no value to the coin. And I, I'll admit that I was kind of on that side, but I was misguided a little bit because what I, I hadn't, what I wasn't taking into account was that the amount of usage on the network was driving that the fees up past what the block reward was, 
creating a value based off of that, right? It's kind of, it's, it's, I would actually uh, say that that's not exact, it's, it's effectively what's happening, yeah. but it's even a little more subtle than that because what's really happening is that people are using what they call DeFi, which is oftentimes just kind of centralized programs running on a decentralized blockchain. Right. And then people are saying, I want to use that to con you know, convert or basically this currency into that currency. And then you got this you know, minor or uh, maximal now, because they're not miners, extracted value or extractable mm -hmm. value, which is actually predatory, where they're front running people and they're taking lots of money. And because it's worth so much money to take money from the people who are using you know, DeFi, even, or maybe if there's real DeFi, you know, people are using that, um, and they have MEV. Now, we, we've actually solved MEV in I the Verus protocol. Ask, yeah, we've solved what it. What I was interested but, about but, there was how do you solve that but also still continue to incentivize miners? Well, right? so, okay, but I, but I really want to, like, make this point on MEV. Okay. What's happening is MEV bots and, you know, the people who are front-running and taking money from the users, making it actually not the great deal that people think it is when they're starting to use these protocols, um, they're making so much money from doing that that if the fees didn't go up to make it pretty much unusable for buying any, you know, small ticket items, like you're not going to go buy coffee on the Ethereum blockchain, you know, right. you're not, you're not going to go even buy uh, even any kind of small thing on the Ethereum blockchain because your fees are going to outweigh whatever it is you're going to buy. And the reason for that is that people are making so much money, taking money from users with MEV, that that drives the fees up. But in reality, it makes it really unusable for a lot of what people thought would be use cases mm -hmm. over time. And you know, so now it's like L2s, but then most L2s are really like multi-sigs, so you lose the decentralization. What we've done is, is quite a bit different. So we basically have kind of a multi-tiered uh, fee structure so that if you do something, like you register an ID, because we have IDs at the low level, we have DeFi at the low level that solves MEV. So if you register an identity, that costs on the Verus network. Now, every blockchain that launches in the protocol has its own independent uh, decision making. They could choose to make their IDs less expensive, you know, but we chose this for a reason because it putting an ID on the chain does have a cost for mm -hmm. miners and stakers, and uh, those IDs can be used to launch blockchains, they can be used for different things, and so. The cost of an ID is 100 Verus. Unless you get a referral, then it's 80 Verus. And if you are, are the referral, then you would earn 20 from rever referring somebody. The amount of that Verus that doesn't go to referrals or get a discount goes to miners and stakers. And it goes into this, uh, what we call a fee pool. This is a Verus technology that um, it aggregates all the fees in every block. And, it, and then the miner or staker takes one one hundredth of the fee pool. And so they still get, over time, exactly the same as if they're just aggregating fees and taking all the fees. But the difference is that all the fees, whether in one block they go up and then they go down, and you know that actually can create some interesting incentives to maybe I want to reorg and get those fees. But there's no reason to do that because you just move to the next block. You're going to get almost the same amount, even if you don't have those giant fees, and so it smooths out over time the fees that are generated. But then we have the ability to say, OK, to launch a blockchain is 10,000 Verus. To uh, register an identity is 100 or 80 you know, for a referred identity. To register a DeFi basket is 200 Verus. And, and it's all permissionless. So you create these different things. The fees are put into the fee pool. And over time, what we're seeing is that the rewards actually go up. But because it's selective on the different things that actually generate different fees, and that's in the protocol, mm -hmm. it still is sub-penny to send funds from one person to another. So you could still buy a coffee. And 
we have like 350 Bitcoin on the Verus network, you know, on the Verus blockchain uh, or between the Verus blockchain and the VR blockchain. And you could definitely buy coffee with sats. You know, you could like you could run a business yeah. and you could sell coffee for Bitcoin sats. So I guess the question I had there is who sets those fees for those different uh, protocols or whatever, or those different um, features like the identity and so on. Who sets those fees initially? Every community that decides they're going to launch a blockchain on the network has the, these are parameters that you mm -hmm. can choose when you're defining the new chain. For Verus itself, who made those decisions? The community. Okay. We, we had discussions and it's like, okay, here, this is what we believe is, you know, a reasonable uh, price now and over time, if Verus is a hundred, it's still reasonable. If Verus is a thousand, it's still, and, and, af, and over time, if the price goes up to these much higher prices, then we would expect that for certain things, people might then start to move to other blockchains in the network if they wanted mm -hmm. to have lower prices. You know what I'm saying? Can, can those change? Is there an ability to change those prices? It's, it's in the protocol. Okay. And if the community wanted to change those prices, then the entire network would have to agree that those prices would change. And I'm always a little bit confused on like the community making those changes and how that works from a gov I, I suppose the term is governance perspective, right? Um, because that's been like a huge discussion surrounding like Bitcoin with the, with the uh, block size wars, block wars, all that sort of stuff. How does Verus approach that? Same as Bitcoin, because okay. basically if you look at it, um, if you're if you're a token and you're running on another blockchain, mm -hmm. then you your governance does not affect the blockchain protocol. Mm -hmm. A blockchain is naturally a governance mechanism. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so the community can say, OK, these are what we believe are the prices. And there could be a release and the network could just decide that they don't want to upgrade to that release and keep it going at the existing levels. And so the community is generally very active people who are mining, who are staking, you know, and so most of the power on the network is likely represented in the community that are, you know, that's like sharing right. these discussions. If for some reason there was a difference of opinion and we've been uh, I would say, you know, quite fortunate that um, I think all of the decisions that we've made along the way, every, the network's pretty much seen that these decisions, I think they've been good for the network. You know, across, mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't have any blockchain wars or things like that yet, maybe in the future at some point. But if that does happen, then it's really just a question of um, what is the network going to do? You know, is mm -hmm. the network going to at, at some point say we don't want to make this upgrade you know and and so if the you know people who are having these discussions say okay you know the the price is so high that we think we should lower the price of identities or we should lower the price in the protocol of um you know defining a blockchain or a currency or something like that which i don't know that there's any reason for that to happen over time because as it grows, I think that there's this model of the network scales un, in an unlimited way. And, it, and the things that need to be less expensive and the e economies will move to the parts of the network where that's true. And the other ones will either stay busy or the prices will naturally adjust to where they should be. Okay. You know what I mean? And so, but if it ever comes to the point where there's a disagreement, then it's like Bitcoin. Uh, you know, um, it's the miners and the stakers who, in the end, decide what the network is. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So that does bring me to, if you got time for a couple more questions. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to talk about, you guys initially had made the decision to go with the proof of power and... Um, basically 50% mining, 50% staking. Was that done specifically to prevent 51% attacks? That was a primary, that was the primary 
reason was to ensure that we had a protocol because if you're Bitcoin right now, you're using, you know, the majority of the world's hash power in that algorithm and no one pretty much can come along and 51% attack your chain, mm -hmm. right? But if you're Bitcoin, if you launch a new cryptocurrency right now that say uses the Bitcoins, uh, you know, the SHA-256 uh, D algorithm, you know, if you're, if you're gonna do that, there's so much hash power available in the world that your little chain is probably very easily gonna be overpowered if you're pure proof of work, mm -hmm. right? The, the key is to have like Nakamoto consensus basically just enables the network to be decentralized and secured by uh, proof of work. Mm -hmm. What we did is we extended that to be 50% proof of stake, 50% proof of work, because that way, even if, you know, and, and we also wanted to be accessible to everyone, so we're mining on CPUs, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no way that a new network is gonna get so much awareness from the whole world, especially a community launch, completely fair launch, you know, not investing uh, funds into doing it as much as just saying, hey, here's a new protocol for the world. We believe that it's what the world needs. If someone decided that they were feeling threatened by that or if someone decided that they just wanted to and they had enough power, they had some data centers that they could point to it, if we didn't have a more secure algorithm than mm -hmm. just proof of work, then the network could be 51% attacked. Well, and CPUs are a little bit more problematic there, right? Because you have a lot of crypto jacking. You know, you could say that, but if we chose, if we chose Bitcoin's algorithm, if we chose script, well, you know, if we chose any of the ones that were existing, right. yeah. then we would have kind of the same problem. And if we chose any simple algorithm that could easily be implemented in an FPGA, right then we would also potentially have, have the that problem that problem yeah. and so the real the real uh reason there were there were that was the primary reason was just people were talking about oh proof of stake is more secure because you you know you have to have currency on the network and no one would shoot themselves in the foot but proof of stake you know has other issues there you know there are a number of other issues that you need to solve in a, in a proof of stake algorithm, one of them at the time, which was not solved on any network, which we, as far as I know, solved on mainnet before any other um, network that had proof of stake, it was nothing at stake. And the and nothing- Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so the nothing at stake problem is, you know, if, you, if you're a miner, for example, just going back to POW first as a starting point, if you're a miner and you are mining and mining to try and get this block and somebody else gets the block, the most advantageous thing for you to do is to just say, okay, someone got that block, I move to the next one, mm -hmm. right? And you move to the next one and the, you put all your power on the next one because you wanna be the person getting the next one, right? With proof of stake, you don't have that investment of hash power. So what you do is if you've got, if you see that maybe there's a little bit of a fork, because it, it happens all the time on kind of the, the tip, you'll see little you know, two different blocks come in or, I mean, that's kind of the way that it works. Mm -hmm. And so you, um, if you see more than one proof of stake block, then it's actually, if you have no solution to what's called nothing at stake, you have no reason, you have nothing at stake. If you choose to, I'm going to stake on that chain fork, I'm going to stake on that one, I'm going to stake on that one. And so you're doing absolutely nothing to help choose the single valid chain that moves forward, you're not okay. helping, right? Okay. That's yeah. the nothing at stake problem. And so, um, so what we did is we basically made it possible that if you actually try to do that, the network, people in the network will see that you tried to do that. They'll be able to present proof to the protocol that you tried to do that and that the stake that was actually won on the chain had other uh, forks that it was also trying to stake on. Okay. And they'll be able to take your reward before you can. How do you do that actually, practically, how do you do that? 
In right. the protocol? Yes. It literally has a way of validating the proof that is presented because every different tip is going to have a different um, last block hash, for example. Okay. And so if you show that the same stake was used with two different last block hashes, mm -hmm. then that means someone is not helping to converge the chain and the protocol is able to validate that that is true. You presented proof that this person signed on both tips, meaning that they were staking with more than one wallet. One wallet saw one tip, one wallet saw the other tip, and that's enough proof for you to spend that block reward and take it for yourself. So basically, everyone in the network who runs uh, a state guard, it's called. Okay. And then they put in, um, because we have privacy, they put in a uh, private address. So nobody can say, oh, that person uh, right. took my reward and I'm gonna be mad at them. The network takes your reward, but it does it because everyone on the network is basically looking in case there might be cheaters and the cheaters don't prosper, okay. basically. Do you think so? There's no slashing, which is actually kind of important. Oh yeah, because we don't yeah, actually agree about that. that you need to slash in order to solve this problem. So we solved it without slashing, mm -hmm. and that then creates this situation where, you know, some people are going to mine, some people, they're going to buy currency, they're going to stake. Some people will mine, get currency, and then they're going to stake with that currency, and so the total decentralization is actually increased when you have both populations working to compete and try to earn blocks. Right. A big trend recently has been uh, something similar, but utilizing or leveraging master nodes. Why not master nodes for Veriscoin? Why staking? So we don't, you know, if typically in a master node situation, you're going to, you're going to have some amount of currency, you're going to lock it up. It's, it's like the, the protocols that, that make you lock up currency mm -hmm. in order to um, earn funds. And you get kind of a privileged position because you're willing to put money in and you have that money to put in and you get kind of this privileged position as a masternode um, operator by locking up funds right. so that nobody's gonna sell those funds so that hopefully you know, there will be less funds available and that might make the price go up. And this, kind of we, we think these are, price. Uh, you know, I have to say, I, it's not necessary for security. And the blockchains are really intended to be used. Does it help with decentralization at least? I think it actually, perspective? I would say it more contributes to centralization. Well, so I say that from the perspective of staking doesn't require a node, right? No, staking requires a node. Okay. It then does. I didn't understand. It that. does require a node, but it's just a node like any other node. Right. And if you and we don't even like the Veris protocol does not require that you lock up your funds. So for security purposes, after 150 blocks, which is 150 minutes on Veris, mm -hmm. um, any currency that you have in your wallet can stake. It stakes on a node, you just turn on staking and now you're staking on that node. And so um, there's no minimum. You don't have to lock things up. Mm -hmm. If you wanna use your funds, you know, they're staking until you use them. You know what I mean? And, and uh, so basically everyone who has it, we've had people in the, in the uh, network earning blocks on less than uh, one Varus of stake. It doesn't happen very often. Right. Because it is, it does depend. The more you have, the more you're going to earn, right? Right. Um, but it happens because it's all statistical, just like, just like mining. Right. So uh, we didn't really see any reason whatsoever. It doesn't, doesn't change security, doesn't change, you know, at least relative to the protocol that we have, we address, as far as I know, we were the first to have a protocol that proves 51% hash attack resistance. Um, you know, we addressed all of the security issues that we were focused on uh, addressing mm -hmm. that, you know, and um, didn't need to force people to commit to, you know, $100,000 or whatever it is that you have to then take of that currency and lock it up in order to do it. It's, we didn't need to have those kinds yeah. of mechanisms to 
to increase security. So be, because it's really, it's like we think of it as it's about computer science more than it's, a, it's not about trying to, you know, force something unnatural to make a number go up. It's, it's more about um, make it secure, create a protocol that is secure inherently. Yeah. And then uh, enable people to uh, mine, do what they want with their coins. If they want to stake them, you know, great. If they want to sell them, other people will buy them. They can stake with them. You know, um, mm -hmm. they could use them for getting IDs. They could use them for launching currencies. They could use it for launching chains. You know, so yeah. we didn't see a need for a master node or any kind of a privileged um, node. It's just proof of power is how much power is on a particular chain, how much stake and how much mining, hash mm -hmm. power. And that is, you know, I mean, Bitcoin didn't need master nodes. Yeah. And so we use But Bitcoin same... didn't need the master nodes because it had all the hash power because it's the first to move, right? Right, except 50% of power on the Varus network is stake. Right. So that serves, it, it's still completely available and open for everybody, you know, decentralized without having special uh, nodes that have special privilege, but it still addresses the security question, mm -hmm. which is at the end of the day, I mean, I, I guess you could say master nodes is potentially a way to address it, but we chose to address the security questions without having to make people lock up funds, without having to, because we saw these things as unnecessary to address the security. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I think the there can be, as far as master nodes, it can be, uh, I don't know if it's conflict of interest to a certain extent, uh, or just forcing people to lock up for that kind of expectation of increase in price because of reduction of supply in, this, in exchange, right? Which is all, all that is really aiming to do, right? Right. It seems to still be successful at the very beginning of all these projects, too, which is kind of funny, um, where they get that initial bump up, and then that kind of, I think BlockX here recently was one of the most recent ones that had that happen. But I think, I think you're mostly last. talking, not mostly talking about fair launch uh, projects with master nodes, right? I, well, there are some fair launch, but I'm trying to think the last one that was. I don't think BlockX was. I know the, the latest one that launched was something called Rogu. I know that wasn't fully fair launch. Because the no, thing is, if you've so. got, if you start with investors and, you know, yeah. a pre-mine or some way that you actually extract funds from the launch, mm -hmm. then you can put funds into driving awareness as well. And you're most likely going to figure out a way to get a bump yeah. at the beginning. Whereas if, you know, we started with, you know, the 15 minute notice and the slow ramp on rewards, no one in any privileged position, not even the developers or any, there was no ICO or these things. And so, so it's just been a kind of a slow, gradual mm -hmm. rise, you know, and, yeah. uh, and that's, that's, I think, it's the organic way. I think that's it's, the best way to go about it. I mean, that's what I did with my YouTube channel. Right, right. right. Um, and, and nowadays, the, the YouTube game has changed where a lot of the new crypto YouTubers and stuff, they work deals with companies and then, or coins, and then they buy YouTube advertising that points to their video. Right. And then, uh, I, I think, understandably, the viewer and the consumer, when they find out about these practices, get very bitter towards them because they're like, well, this is all fake. Like, I thought you were credible because of the amount of views and subscribers, but those aren't genuine views and subscribers. Right. And that translates over into the way you launch a blockchain as well, right? right. And I, so I definitely like uh, agree with that form. I've always been against ICOs, against pre-mines, all of that. I even am like a little leery surrounding even like community funds, which I know you guys have, and we talked about that. Um, it's donated from people. As long as it's donated it's from just people, donated. then yeah. it's good. It's not I, someone coming in and saying, you know, I'm going to invest and I want something back. Right. It's basically people donating and saying like, you know, like everything here, mm -hmm. it was donated. And they're saying, 
I'm going to donate. I know, you know, what I'm donating for, and yeah. I just want to see everything work that mm -hmm. I donate, you know? And, yeah. and, it's, and it's like, if it works, and everyone works to try and make it work, then that's great. So, um, and, and, you know, we, as uh, all the founders, donated, like, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the early mining and, like, yeah. a large portion of early mining, and, the majority of early mining and staking, to back into the community to help just basically bootstrap things. And so, um, and, I, and I want to acknowledge, because you said something, I want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, kudos to you for actually doing what you do and not coming along and say, you know, I want to sell you an interview because you didn't do that. Yeah. And you didn't, you, you know, sometimes like uh, when people have interviewed, they might make sure to ask the question, did I ask for something? You know, you didn't even do that. Yeah. But I want to make clear, you didn't ask for anything. No, I'm here you, to you, get, you, make the video. You're actually everybody. helping inform people, you know, and we need more people like you in the industry doing that because that's genuine. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I do want to ask you, because everybody's miners here, do you still mine? Yeah, I do, actually. I, I, I mine... Um, you know, when we actually, when we uh, went away, so when we had secret FPGAs that we found out about and we modified the algorithm to be unfriendly to FPGAs so that CPUs basically do mine with better uh, ROI, better hash per watt, you know, than FPGAs can, even mm -hmm. if they implement an algorithm, um, as I mentioned, you know, GPUs were kind of a casualty of the process because they're in between, right? Yeah. And, and I had uh, a big, you know, multi-GPU mining rig going and I was mining with that and everything, but um, it wasn't about what I wanted. It was really what is good for the network. Mm -hmm. And so even though I had all those GPUs mining, the right thing to do was to make it so that, you know, we are not friendly for FPGAs so that everyone in the world can still mine. Right now we have, you know, most mining, as I mentioned on, uh, I think probably more on cell phones even than CPUs, but it's a mixture of CPUs and cell phones. Yeah. And so I mine on Rock Pies, I mine on uh, Ryzen, and I have a phone that I mine with. Yeah. But I don't have anywhere near, you know, kind of the, power that I used to have on the network relative to the overall hash power. I have a very tiny, tiny little bear. miner footprint, you know, um, but I mine. Yeah. yeah. Do you mine anything other than Barris? No. No. Okay. Well, I merge mine. Uh, well, I merge so, mine VR. Okay. So you get some um, of the so, pirate. Yeah. I merge mine VR and yeah. I, and I merge mine with Varus. and any other new chain that comes along onto the network, I'll be contributing my mining for that as well. I was going to ask that. So if you're merge mining uh, VR, right, is there a way to bridge those assets out to Pirate Chain? Uh, yeah, the, the I, so I VR, VR and uh, Pirate Chain are both supported in the Komodo wallet. Okay. And so um, they do their atomic swap option okay. between VR and, uh, and the Pirate Chain. Okay. You know, there's DeFi on VR. Right. It's built in, and, and they've got Bitcoin. They've got, you know, on their network, they've got, on VR, they've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, DAI, um, Varus, you know, and on Varus, there's DeFi. And so for me personally, I don't really need to go outside out, of that so ecosystem. I don't need to go outside that ecosystem. Right. Um, and I don't, I'm not really, I'm just, I'm just mining you know, VR and holding whatever I get. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of people on the network are mining VR. I mean, it's actually got a really decent hash rate right now, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, I'll merge mine uh, currencies that come along as well, because that's kind of, that's kind of the point. Um, and I stake with whatever little VR I have, mm -hmm. but I don't really have a lot. So I can't really. So I had one question. I'm trying to figure this out technically, and it, you reminded me of it. 
Because earlier you were talking about like if you launch a chain on Varus, right? Um, that chain will get automatically get all of the security. It it okay. This go is on. What I, go on with your question. Uh, maybe I'm not because I don't. I think I'm misunderstanding this because all right. You you have to build if you want to mine it. You have to build a node for that chain. Well, you just run a node. It's the same right. node as what you would run on Varus. But it just still you still have option. to have you still have to do something to run it. Yeah. To run it. Yeah, yeah. Which means you don't automatically adopt all of that. Hash Unless you're rate. pool mining. Right. Unless you're pool mining. And if you're pool mining, I think. But that pool would still have to support that they, new they, chain. That's correct. Correct. Okay, so I'm just, I'm trying to lay it, I'm trying to like, if yeah, I'm drawing yeah. this out in my head, yeah. right? Because what you had said, maybe I misunderstood, was you launch a chain and it gets the security. So the reason is incentives. Okay. It all boils down to incentives. I mean, everything from the beginning of crypto boils right. down to incentives. And so when you launch a new chain, that is a 10,000 Varus fee initially. There's no rent. You don't pay anything on ongoing... You know, the chain's independent, right. it runs on its own, doesn't pay any gas or anything to anybody else. But to start it, you use 10,000 Varus. Mm -hmm. 5,000 of that Varus is emitted on the Varus chain, goes into the fee pool, and so the Varus rewards, when there's going to be a new chain launch, go up right. significantly, mm -hmm. and, you, and they last for a while at a higher level. And so... Anyone who's mining or staking notices that, number one. So right. they say, okay, what, like if they didn't know that there was going to be a chain launch, mm -hmm. well, now they know most likely. Right. Because they're now getting way more rewards. More yeah. And then they say, where's the chain launch? And if, they, if they're on a pool that knows about it, mm -hmm. then they don't have to really necessarily do anything. If they're solo or they're staking solo, then they're going to want to bring up a node because the other... 5,000 of that 10,000 mm -hmm. comes out on the new chain okay. as fees. And so it, whatever the reward is of this new chain, and that's just up to whoever is launching this new chain, right. whatever that reward is, it's going to start off with close to 50 Varus in addition for every block on that new chain, and that's going to go down as whatever the uh, definition of that new chain um, for its own security goes up. You okay. know what I'm saying? And so most likely in any foreseeable future, any foreseeable future, when there's a new chain launch on the Varus network, most likely a large, like more than probably the majority of the hash power of the network is going to be merge mining that chain in its launch, giving it massive security as a right. chain launching. I think from a pool op, you would almost want to be pulling that. Is there like an API that tracks that, that you can pull that down? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then just script in standing up that you can node. Do that. Yeah. That's all I would do if I was a pool op. That would make sense. Yeah, you and can. That way you're just automatically adding everything immediately, right? You can you can just do a query. It's in the. It's in the uh, command line or the RPC, you know, yeah. you can just do a query to, to find out what are the new the chains, chains. And, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool, awesome. Yeah, because I'm always, a, I'm a systems engineer by trade, so whenever huh. I'm thinking, I'm like trying to draw the lines out and be like, does that make sense to me right. or does that not? So I, I'm glad I clarified that because I think I didn't get that, it wasn't clicking in okay. my head, so I think it clicks now a lot better. All right. So thank you. That's yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Can you tell everybody where they can find you? And I know Discord at Varus, uh, VarusCoin.io slash Discord or Varus.io slash Discord. So Varus.io slash Discord right. will get you an invite to the Discord. That's where, um, that's basically where most of the community works on a daily basis. You know, everything we do is in the open. All of the software that the community builds, generally all the software, you know, it's permissionless. Someone can come in and they could make a closed source thing, but we really like open source. Yeah. And so most everybody in the community who builds things or, you know, the core developers in the community who build things release it open source under permissive licenses. And, uh, and every, you know, we have uh, twice a week 
community meetings where we decide things and talk about what's going on and, and figure out what, you know, what the community should be focused on at the time. And so everything's really just in the open, but most of our work does, uh, most of our open discussions and work and everything else take place on Discord. Okay. And you get that invite from Varus.io slash Discord. Awesome. And then on Twitter, it's just at Varus? Uh, Twitter, there are a few different, uh, because it's decentralized. So we've got uh, at Varus Community. Okay. Uh, there's at Varus Coin. I think at Varus Community is, is a very busy account. Okay. There's at Varus Coin. I don't know how busy it is, but it's also a community account. Um, there is at, I think it's Varus whale alerts, you know, that okay. somebody, that somebody brought up and that, and the person who did that, I actually, I don't know for sure, like who that is, yeah. but they're definitely in the community that yeah. at Varus, uh, whale alerts. And they also created, a kind of a, it's like, it has a look of like a coin market cap or one of the aggregators. And it basically is all of the DeFi baskets across the Varus ecosystem. Oh, that's cool. And all of the volume and the, because one of the interesting things is we are, we have this totally decentralized um, DeFi protocols and we have millions of dollars of volume yeah. that actually happens with conversions on chain and this, like I would say, 95 or more percent it's got to be more than that it's probably like in the 99 percent range of all the volume for varus is literally on chain because you know we solved mev so you don't have to worry about mev and people use that mm -hmm. it's a you know as a way to get basically the best fair um you know conversion on any currency that you might happen to have right. that you can send over to varus and then convert it into whatever you want um, it also is possible, and people do this, to arbitrage, but you can't front run. Okay. So you, you can, so actually, because we solved MEV, but we also recognize that truly decentralized finance and, you know, truly decentralized AMMs, automated market makers that are on the chain uh, as part of the protocol, not smart contracts, um, it's arbitrage that keeps those prices aligned with right. other markets across the network or even external centralized exchanges. And so people do arbitrage, but they can't front run anybody. So they basically just look at price differences, they arbitrage, and we made the decision to actually build into the protocol. There is a way in the protocol for miners and stakers to say, okay, I'm about to solve the, all the DeFi, and we're the only network that I, and I'm sure that we're the only network, that actually solves um, all DeFi transactions in a block simultaneously. Okay. So there, like I said, there's no front, there's no back, you can't sandwich, it doesn't matter. You can't, re reordering doesn't matter. Everybody gets the same price, you know, in all directions in a liquidity basket. So if you are a miner or a staker, and it's actually built in to the wallet, to the node, okay. to do this. Um, you have a dash auto arbitrage. I think it's like, I'd, I'd have to actually Some go look command. at the exact, okay. there's, a, there's, a, there's an option. We'll find it in Discord later. Yeah, and, and so what it does is, if you're solving a DeFi uh, uh, set of a bundle, uh -huh. bundle of transactions, and you're gonna do that solve on your node because you're gonna earn that block, then you can arbitrage if that is, say, different from other um, baskets, or we also have an on-chain marketplace. If people are putting limit orders in the on-chain marketplace to do exchanges and this kind mm -hmm. of thing, you can fill limit orders and funnel those, the results of those limit orders into your solve. You get to add only on a specific point designed into the protocol. Okay the miners and the stakers actually have the advantage, the validators have the advantage, but it's not to reorder. It doesn't take anything from anybody because what you do is you can add transactions by joining people. Okay. So if you're arbitraging and you're gonna earn money from doing that, what you're really doing is you're bringing the price that is the final price closer to the fair market price always. Right. And it's constructive, it's beneficial. Everybody transacting 
gets the same price, Benefit including you. It. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. I'm gonna go look up that flag and try to. Do yeah, that. You, you might as well run it. You, you, in order to do arbitrage, you do have to have uh, some currency in your wallet. But the currency, you, you could arbitrage, you know, Ethereum, because we have baskets with Ethereum in them. Mm -hmm. You could arbitrage with uh, Dai. Or you could arbitrage with Bitcoin. But that's all going to be within the Veriscoin ecosystem. Right. And right. one of the, it is, but you can, if you want to arbitrage across like a centralized exchange or across other networks that are not within the Veriscoin ecosystem, mm -hmm. then you don't have the same kind of built-in protocols to do that. Then you have to do more traditional arbitrage, but you still can't front run anyone in Veris. Right. You still can't. Take you can't advantage do that of on the Veris side. On the Veris side, you don't yeah. have MEV. You can't like take from users. People get you know as fair as can be. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing about the way that the arbitrage is built in, you put your arbitrage transactions in, mm -hmm. and they only go off if you get the block. So it's mm -hmm. actually when you do your arbitrage. That's why it, it was able. In, so I actually put the capability of doing this with those flags into the node. Okay. Because it's only beneficial. Yeah. But it could, like, it doesn't do every possible thing that you could do. Okay. It kind of looks for low-hanging fruit and, it, and yeah. it uses that, right? But if someone came along and said, you know, I'm, I'm a quant and I'm a really great programmer and I want to do, like, arbitrage for everything that squeeze out every little bit of value, it only helps the network and it only helps the users because all you're ever able to do is join but when you do it you have perfect knowledge at that moment so you it's like you know when you're doing normal arbitrage across say two different exchanges or right. across some decentralized uh, you know defi basket and a centralized exchange if you get one side of it and you don't get the other you might lose yeah right this is not a guarantee, but this is actually how the protocol works. You put your arbitrage transaction in only if you're going to earn. Right. And if you don't get the block, it doesn't go off. And so basically you start with perfect knowledge. And if you get that block, then that's just a boost for what you earn. Nice. That's interesting. And that adds additional incentives for miners and stakers. Right. It actually cool. even adds additional incentives for people who figure this out yeah. to become miners and stakers. And so over time, you know, we've got, I, like I said, I think something like 60 million of other currencies that people have sent over to the Veris network. You know, so people call that TVL. We don't lock things, but mm -hmm. you, you can send other currencies over and in a decent, actually decentralized, provable way. And, um, and so as that grows, because it just continues to grow, as that grows, you know, larger and larger players who figure this out are likely going to really want to become miners and stakers. Gotcha. That's cool. Yeah. And that's, that, that's just a, ver a uniquely Varus uh, yeah. technology as well. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Base and there's an auto arbitrage in the node itself. So for solo miners or pool operators, you could enable that flag now. Should. Probably should do that <laughs> if, you, if you haven't already. <laughs> All right, thanks, yeah. Mike. It was great talking to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And, and, uh, great make to... sure you guys go follow them and check it all out. And then if you guys have follow-up questions, leave them in the description below, and I'll shoot them over your way. And maybe we can do a follow-up over Zoom or something like that later sure. on if people have questions. So. Sounds great. All right, thank all you. All right, thank you. They'll have harder questions than me, I promise. <laughs> all right, look forward to it. <laughs> all right, thanks.